Hello and welcome to this short skills video on Rose and Signs Principles of Instruction for Level 1 and Below Learners. My name is Kelly Adams and I'm the Product Manager for Level 1 and Below, including work skills and personal growth and wellbeing. So in the short skills video today, we're going to look at Rose and Signs Principles of Instruction and how these can be used in the classroom to develop greater progress for learners. The principles of instruction is a theory devised by Barrett Rosenstein, and this theory is based in research that he did based around cognitive science, and he combined that with classroom observation, and this was based around the following three things. First of all, how to effectively implement classroom strategies, so how to make sure the things that you're doing in the classroom are working. The second one was how to help learners learn and remember the new material that you're teaching them. Often as a teacher, one of the challenges we face once we teach is trying to get the learners to be able to remember the information and use that effectively. So his research also looked at this and the best way to do that. We also looked at how much support should be given to learners and when that should take place. And from this investigation on cognitive science and classroom observation, he devised a theory to help tackle some of these issues that we're going to look at today. So in terms of the skills video, why principles of instruction? So principles of instruction has been recognised to have given great gains in the classroom because it really focuses on aspects of teaching that are central to everything we do in the classroom. So for example, questioning is very important alongside building blocks of knowledge as well. Now what Rosenstein's principles of instruction really does is it allows us to draw together some links between the theory, what the theory says should happen, and also investigated classroom practice. And from that, he was able to produce these guidelines that, as I say, have been used and tested in the classroom and research has been done on them and they're found to be very, very effective in terms of teaching. The reason for that is it provides a link between teacher actions and the process of learning. So it allows teachers to say, if I do this in my classroom, this is what's going to happen to my learning. Uh, of the students so it's very very useful in terms of that and what it makes it a really really useful theory to use is that it has clear strands so it's very clear at each step what you should be doing to help develop the practice in the classroom so Rose, Rosenstein's principles instruction is a very important modern concept that will help with these things so what we're going to do now is we're going to go through the 10 principles and have a little discussion about these Please note that this is not a checklist, so you may use some of these in the lesson more than others. You don't have to think, right, I've got an hour lesson, let's get all these 10 things in. It should occur naturally within the flow of the lesson. So the first one we're going to look at is to begin the lesson with a review. So daily review is very, very important in order to process or for learners to process the learning that they've done before. So what Rose and Shai recommends is that lessons maybe take five to eight minutes spend that time reviewing the learning. Now, the research that Rosenshine undertook shows that learners who regularly practice this, retrieving the learning from the previous lesson, are more likely to cement that in their long-term memory. So they're more likely to remember lesson material. Now, there's various different ways you could do this. You could use many whiteboards, you could do quizzes, you could ask direct questions, or you could give short essay-type responses. You could ask them to do a particular task, for example. Um, and that would really help as well. OK, moving on to principle two is presenting material in small steps. So the second principle of Rosenstein is that he recommends that all material is taught in small steps or bite sized chunks. Using research, he discovered that this can increase the rate of progress for learners. Introducing too much, as you may have found out in the classroom sometimes if, if that happens, restricts learning because the learners can't actually process that because there's too much to process. So when teaching level one and below learners, doing it in bite-sized chunks is really, really beneficial, which is why these principles are quite useful for those types of learners. Now, doing it in bite-sized chunks means that we reduce the cognitive load and that helps the metacognition to take place, which again aids learning for the learners. Moving on to principle three. So principle three recommends that you ask a large number of questions. Questions are perhaps underpinned within Rosenstein's theory quite a lot. Rosenstein states that questions are really powerful tools 
because what they do is they help teachers to identify what's been learned, what's not been learned, and identify any misconceptions that can be addressed before future learning takes place. Questioning is very valuable in the classroom because it fosters practice retrieval. So it asks the learner to retrieve their learning and explain that, which helps it to store in the long term memory because it deepens their understanding because they're continually using the, the work that they've learnt using the questioning from the classroom. Strategies here that are quite popular and work really well with asking questions is, for example, asking pre-questions. Using wait times is particularly important, particularly with lower ability learners. So make sure that you, if you're asking them a question, give them enough wait time so that they can process what you're asking of them and formulate an answer. Sometimes as teachers, we are quick to want to get the answer, but we need to give the learners time to be able to do that. And also ask them to foster self-questioning. So try and really build into your learning and get them to ask, am I doing this right? Why am I doing this? How does this work? Because again, that's going to strengthen and deepen their learning and understanding. Principle four, providing models. So when you're teaching, and you'll probably have done this before, it's very important to provide models um, so that learners can understand what you're asking them to do and be able to do that accurately. So when delivering new information to learners, you need to model your thought process and show learners what to do and how to do that. The research that Rosenstein did shows that when this happens and you provide the models, learners perform better academically and are more likely to stay on task because they understand what's being asked of them and then they address that. They're also less likely to get stuck. Now, if you provide models, I think that's really beneficial for level one learners because if you provide those models, they're less likely to go off task. They're more likely to be confident in what you're asking them to do, which I think breeds really successful learning. Principle five, guiding student practice. So all teachers um, try and do this all the time, but Rosenstein states that the more successful teachers give their learners more time for questioning, more time for guidance and more time for process repetition. So this needs to be built into your lessons in terms of allowing them more time to be able to complete and understand the task that you're asking. Now, the different ways in which you could do that is you could use rephrasing, you could use summarising, you could use evaluation, or you could use applying knowledge. And some of the methods you could use to try and get that information could be, for example, modelling. You could, for example, use worked examples to try and get them to evaluate things. And one example that I particularly like for lower ability or for perhaps less confident learners is use of first attempts at learning. Learners need to understand and be comfortable with the fact that this is their first attempt at learning this. It's not their only attempt and it doesn't matter if they get it wrong. And that really breeds confidence and allows learners to be able to feel confident with the new material that you're providing to them and confident in their learning. Principle six, check for student understanding. So it's really important as a teacher to check for understanding and continuous use of direct questions to learners helps you as a teacher to check your understanding and identify any misconceptions. This is perhaps one of the most important principles because it underpins everything that you do. Because you're looking for that student understanding, you're trying to identify if you need to reteach or rephrase or restructure or model the information to help those students to learn. And the best way to do that is through questioning. So questioning and checking for understanding is probably one of the most important principles because if you get this one right, you're likely to get the rest of them right and follow on from that as well. Principle seven, obtain a high success rate. So mastery learning, if you do mastery teaching, ensures that learners are ready to move on. So what we want before they move on is that they understand everything, that they're not going to take any misconceptions with them into future learning. Now, the optimal success rate that Rosenstein says is optimal in terms of retention and knowledge is 80%. Now, if you're doing a test or anything like that, that's the kind of score we're aiming for. It means that they haven't found things too easy because their understanding has been challenged because they've not got 100%, but also it allows them to see that they are progressing they are doing well in their learning. And this can provide motivation to learners 
because learners can feel knowledge that they've succeeded. So maybe perhaps they get around 76% in terms of a test or something like that. They can see that they're achieving. They're not achieving, overachieving. So they're not getting too confident and ignoring learning. They're not getting 30%, which will really demotivate them. So they can only get a high success rate from doing all the other rest of the principles. But that's the kind of attempts at getting um, positive reinforcement by trying to do these tests and get them to score around 80%. That allows them to feel confident, but also shows and demonstrates they need to, some elements of improvement as well. But we should only test them when we feel confident that they fully learned the material. Principle eight. So principle eight is checking for student understanding. So checking for understanding is particularly important and we can use scaffolding for difficult tasks. So in our peers and qualifications, for example, there's nothing wrong with you scaffolding and demonstrating tasks so long as the learners don't copy that into their assignment. So as long as you're using that for practice. So Rosenstein suggests that teachers should kind of use those temporary scaffolds and that allows learners to be more confident. And as they become more confident, we should perhaps remove those very slowly so that learners can move towards independence. Uh, but we can only do that once learners become more confident. So in the classroom, in terms of this, this could include modelling tasks, including few checklists, providing them a checklist of things that they need to do. That's particularly useful. And you can check that out on one of the other videos where we talk about those kind of strategies. They're particularly useful for lower ability learners because it allows them to breed a certain element of confidence in their learning. Or we can do that by asking probing questions to really deepen and understand how learners are finding scaffolds and those kind of things. Principle nine. So principle nine is independent practice. So what we're ultimately aiming to do with using all of these principles is to get learners to move towards independent practice. So after using scaffolding, for example, learners should be now be more competent in tasks, more competent in their knowledge, and their shop should be moving towards completing tasks independently. This will take some time. Some learners may pick this up straight away and be able to work independently. But for most learners, they're going to have to really build up to this to be able to foster independence. And fostering independence is particularly important if you've got lower ability learners or SEND learners, because that allows them to use those skills not only for the qualifications, but for life as well. So what we like to do with independent practice to, to kind of guide that is the repetition of tasks. So if you rep repeat a task, that fosters more deep learning. So that then stores more in their long-term memory and frees up space for their working memory to handle the new learning that's going to take place. Now, to supplement your independent practice in the classroom, you should focus on perhaps regular homework tasks. There's some evidence in research that students who get regular homework and do well, building on the skills that they've learned in the classroom independently, are likely to score 10% higher on any test. Now, obviously, with our qualifications at this level, it's past merit distinction. Or if you're doing work skills or personal growth and well-being, it's just pass. So that doesn't quite apply here. But what it might do is move it learning from pass, for example, to merit. Now, also, in terms of independent practice, you should focus on the why. So get students to really deep think about why. Why would you do it that way? Why is it important, for example, to do a skills audit if you're looking for a job? Why is it important to learn how to cook correctly? And those kind of things. Now, in order to make independent practice successful, you need to include deadlines. Deadlines are really, really important because learners need to practice this skill. Because in many life experiences, they're going to have to manage deadlines. So it's really important within the qualifications that you get them to manage those deadlines well. So when you set a homework, for example, tell them it has to be in a particular day, so on and so forth. The final principle is monthly and weekly reviews. Now, these should be built into your lessons along maybe, for example, every month, once a month, every week, however many lessons you have with those learners. So Rosen says it is particularly important to build in these reviews because it aids the recall of information. And by aiding the recall of information and getting learners to think about past learning, this helps with long-term processing. And what it also does once you go on to teach the new material is that it helps make connections between old and new learning. So it helps you to identify what they've learned before, how they can use that to develop their new learning. And it gives them a really solid and confident foundation that learners really like 
and then they're growing confidence and they'll be able to move then towards further independent practice or something along that line. So those are Rosenstein's 10 principles of instruction. If you're interested in these, you may also be interested to know that Sherrington, a guy called Tom Sherrington, also developed um, a classroom model for Rosenstein's principle in action. So they are the same kind of principles, but what Sherrington has done is, is interpreted them and grouped them into four strands. So if you look on the right hand side there, you can see you've got reviewing material, questioning, sequencing concepts and stages of practice. So what Sherrington has done is taken the model, the theory of Rosenstein and put it into an easy to use um, structure for the classroom. So if you're interested in using this in the classroom, you might also be interested to look up Sherrington's work just to see which one you prefer in terms of the way it's organised, which one you find easiest to use as a theory, and then you'd be able to go and use that in the classroom. So if you're interested in that, I recommend that you look Tom Sherrington up. So that's the end of the short skills video. If you want to discover more about our qualifications in the suite, if you go to Pearson Qualifications and look for entry level or level one, or work skills or personal growth and well-being and you'll be able to find out a little bit more about the qualifications that we offer. Thank you for watching this short video. I hope you enjoyed it. I will see you soon.